time now for our next fireside chat and with me today is Julie Kent and the only way, word I can use for you Julie is busy busy busy. It's been a great year for you this year as well because not only have you retired, uh, you retired from your work at Dean Close School but you also moved house and the icing on the cake surely has to be that MBE which uh, was for services to charities. So shall we start with the MBE because that seems a logical place to start and uh, Tell us about it. What, you know, what, how long did you know about it before it was published to public, public, public? And, uh, you know, your sort of initial reaction to when you, you, got, you got the letter. Uh, well, I didn't get the letter. I got an email, actually, oh, and it was um, the first week of June. And it was during lockdown. So I was working upstairs um, in my office in the boarding yeah. house and Vern was downstairs and an email came in and it was all capital letters and numbers and to start with I thought oh gosh this is spam and Vern's words in my ear you know be careful don't open anything that you're not sure what it is and everything so I looked at it and I thought that's a bit odd you know it's like B-D-O-M or something and um, I thought well I'll open it and as long as I don't click on anything it'll be fine so I opened it and cabinet office was on the top and then it was kind of queen member of the british order of something and i was kind of oh my word what what is this kind of thing and then read it and then scrolled down um because to start with i thought oh maybe it's a bem it's quite you know the way they word it and then i looked down and then it said mbe and i was my heart was going like this and I ran down the stairs to tell Vern, and Vern was on the phone, um, and I ran into the room and he was like this, you know, that meant I'm on the phone dealing with something very important and not as important as whatever you're trying to tell me. And so I went back upstairs and reread it a couple of times, and it said, um, you know, congratulations, will you accept it? And if you do, you're not allowed to tell anyone until the autumn. So this was the first week in June, and because they wanted to give yeah. a few hundred, and we know that, don't we? Because we yeah. were asked in the Honourable Company to put people forward yeah. to um, to get one during. So, um, and then it was it was a bit like I I likened it to being proposed to by your hot partner, um, and they propose to you, and you say yes, and they say, well, yes, we will we will get married, but you can't tell anyone for four months. It's, it's, you know, every time you saw, spoke to relatives, you just couldn't, you were bursting to say something and you couldn't. Yeah. But, um, you know. It's fantastic and a great honour to you. And it, as I say, it was for charity. And I mean, looking at your CV, um, you, do, you do an awful lot for charity, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I, someone asked me recently, I gave a talk and someone recently asked me, do I think I would have raised money if I hadn't have lost my daughter? Yeah. And that I remember um, we went on holiday with another family um, somewhere in Cornwall and it was all kind of um, cottages and there was um, a hotel in the middle and there were there was lots of things on for adults but not very much on for children I think I was about 15 at the time and so I had a portable record player that the speakers went on the top and I could carry it anywhere so I could listen to Fleetwood Mac wherever I was and um, and I organized on this um, holiday camp place, a disco for all the children. And I remember there were collecting tins on the bar and I don't know what the charity was, but I said to the man, why don't we charge everyone two pounds or something? And we'll put the money in your collecting tins. So I obviously did have a sort of charitable gene there somewhere, I think, mm. which is good. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, um, I'll just run through the list here because you're currently vice chairman of the Pied Piper you're chairman of Open Door in Cheltenham, you're a trustee at Goals Beyond Grass, and of course you're junior warden at the Honourable Company, which, which uh, isn't in the same division, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's significant of giving. Um, do you want to talk us through quickly, you know, Pi Piper, start with that? I mean, Pi Piper's been going a while, started of course by our friend and Honourable yeah. Company colleague, uh, Peter Hickman. Uh, how long have you been involved with the Pied Piper? Well, that's interesting because the Pied, I, we had our first daughter in 1992 and um, three years later, um, 
we she died she had a brain tumor when she was three and we started a charity in her name called the emily kent charitable trust yes. which was for children in gloucestershire with cancer and um, at the same time peter hickman was um raising money for the pied piper to build a new children's hospital or children's center and when it was um really taking shape um they came to us and said would we donate any money and at the time we said, well, we would give 50,000 if the oncology part would be yeah. called the Emily Kent unit and it is still called the Emily Kent unit today. And of course in the 90s, 50,000 was quite Yeah. Um, and they were very, were very thankful. Peter remembers it very well. Mm. And, and then we had a son and then we had a daughter and, and we folded the Emily Kent Charitable Trust. And I raised money mainly for Click Sergeant, really, and Teenage Cancer Trust, Breast Cancer, that sort of thing. And then Nick Brody came to me and said, um, would I be a trustee? And I said, oh, I haven't got time. You know, I was in a boarding house then, living with 60 teenage girls. I haven't got time. And he said, oh, you only, you only have to attend three meetings a year. That's all you have to do, Julie. And I'm not sure what, what went wrong, really. <laughs> Obviously now, you know, I oversee the office. I'm actually in the office now uh, three days a week. And I do all the social media, do the newsletter once a week, um, talk to the trustees into opening a charity shop. That took me a while, but um, hopefully we're going to open another one soon too. But, um, and it's, you know, it is my passion really for sick children mm. because obviously I had a sick child and I know what it's like to be a parent of a sick child. So that, that's Pied Piper really. Um, Chartnam Open Door, I never intended to be a chairman. Um, I think Nick thinks it's very funny that I'm a chairman because I'm really not good with numbers at all. You know, when the accountants come in, I have to get my husband to explain it all to me. Um, and that was really through a pupil at Dean Close who said, Mrs. Kent, can we raise money for Chartnam Open Door? And I hadn't heard of it at all. And it's a house on Grosvenor Street in the centre of Chartnam that um, feeds three times a week anyone that comes and wants a hot meal and we're extremely um, non-judgmental we some of them we don't know anything about them at all and interestingly we met with I met with the trustees last week because we're doing a new um, vision and mission and everything and um, one of the trustees said so so um, let me get this right someone could drive their Porsche and drive and park it in the car park and come and have a free lunch and I said yeah they could if they wanted to because we don't ask if people turn up and they want to, that person could be very lonely they might drive yeah. a Porsche because you know at the moment we say it is for people that are lonely a lot of them have mental health issues some are homeless quite a few live in sort of accommodation that is provided by the council or whatever um, but it's really, there is a guy who comes who actually doesn't have any family at all. Um, he lives in Hadley and he comes on the bus and um, he comes because he is lonely. And, but before the pandemic, we were feeding about 50, 55 people a week. And now we're feeding between 70 and 80 people a week. Wow. So we need, we're desperately looking for new premises to uh, move to a bigger, bigger house. And then probably go five days a week um, and offer more help and services for them really. I wonder, I think, I wonder whether this, one of the downsides, I mean there's a lot of downsides about Covid frankly, but in that sense of isolation and loneliness, so organisations like Open Door will, I'm mm. sad to say, see an increasing number of people coming forward. Yeah, it's, it's amazing the camaraderie actually. There was a girl, a young girl who came for a lunch a couple of weeks ago and she obviously lives in a flat where there's a lot of drugs or whatever. And um, there was another guy who was saying to her, you need to get out of there and they're not good, you need to get out. And he was, uh, excuse me, he was, um, I, I was just really impressed that he was very, very caring towards her. And, and I think even, you know, on the streets or wherever, I think they were squatting actually, that there is a sense of camaraderie, which is amazing. Mm. No, I, I can understand that completely. Um, what about goals beyond grass? That's one I ah, have yeah. um, Goals beyond grass, again, um, I think I met goals beyond grass through the Honourable Company, actually, because um, in the sports group, we had um, supplied some power chairs with Pied Piper um, yeah. for 
it's young children playing football in wheelchairs, um, power chairs they're called, and they have like a plate on the front. And it is, I can hardly get the machine to go backwards and forwards, let alone spin round and score a goal or anything. But um, Brian Dix, who is the chairman, he, I used to, you know, I am a social media queen, so everywhere I go, I put everything out. And I think he asked me to be a trustee and ambassador to get more attention to them because they're quite a small charity. Yeah. And he, they don't ask very much of me at all. They might say, oh, Judy, can you put this out? And if I put it out, you know, I can get possibly get more followers following it or whatever. So, um, but it's, a, it's an amazing charity. And again, I do kind of have a passion for local charities. I have yeah. a thing about big charities with people that earn big salaries. And um, I just, you know, I just think if you raise, if you have an event and you raise a thousand pounds, I want the people to see where that thousand pound goes, not be lost on someone's petrol bill or whatever it is. I yeah. just think it's really important to, you know, raise the money in Gloucestershire and spend it on the people in Gloucestershire. Yeah. I think turning the clock back, Julie, it's fair to say that you are a Gloucestershire girl. I mean, you know, you born and bred in Gloucester, you went to school here. OK, I know you went to university, but you came back and you've lived here all your life and you've now recently moved from Cheltenham to Gloucester. So, you know, I don't think many people do that, you know, uh, but certainly perhaps during it, maybe I should say that I doubt there are many members in the Honourable Company who are actually born and bred. Gloucestershire. I, I certainly are. I am not. And I know that, um, you know, Helen uh, Lovett wasn't. She was born in New Zealand. Chris Gaskell wasn't. <laughs> you know, there aren't many of us. And I, you know, I wonder what it was, uh, you know, what was the draw to bring you back from, you know, you had a, you had a, a, a career as a professional musician, you know, mm. you, you know, you, you went all around the world in bands and all that sort of stuff, being a rock chick, that I'm sure you were. <laughs> what, I was. I bet you were. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we could hear some of those stories at some time, but that would take forever. But you know, what 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 brought you back? Um, family is really important to me. I have to say, uh, not many people move from Cheltenham to Gloucester. We should say yeah. that really. Most people, when they move from Gloucester to Cheltenham, you know, they never want to come back. And I was really excited about coming back. Um, family is very important. I went to Leeds um, to do jazz and light music, and then played a bit around there, but came back to Gloucester really um, to sort of decide what I was going to do next. And, and for a very short while, I worked at Seven Sound. Um, oh, right. And then started playing with different bands and just um, stayed. There was, there was one band I played with and they were quite young. When I say quite young, I was probably then about 23, 24 and they were 19, 20. And I played sax in this band and they wrote all their own stuff and they wanted to move to London mm. and I'd already lived you know as a student with five guys and oh I, I didn't really want to do it again very tempted I thought what if they go off and be famous and I decided not to go and my mum even said I'll pay the rent on your flat Julie just in case they all become famous but they didn't become famous and uh <laughs> decision not to go so but I just I love Gloucestershire and you know, amazingly, David Owen said, um, didn't he, in what well, might not have been in ours, it's something else I've seen him in recently. And he came back in his 30s. And I said, why did you come back in your 30s? Mm. He said, because it's a wonderful place to bring up children. You know, London is exciting. But when they decided to have children, he wanted to come back and bring them up in Gloucestershire. And it is a fun, beautiful, fantastic place to live. Yeah. So, so your son and daughter, I mean, uh, I think I'm right saying your daughter is local because you have... You have a granddaughter, don't you? I do. I do yeah. have uh, Amalia. She's just one, so Christmas is going to be great. Yeah. But my, um, they both live in Cheltenham. My, my son and daughter both live in Cheltenham. Yeah. Okay. But so they like coming back here because this is our house. Yeah, they were born in this house. And then, we, of course, we went and lived in a boarding house for 20 years. And this house in Hucklecote was rented out. So, okay. um, yeah, it's, it's nice being back. I like it. What about the work then? I mean, you, you know, you, you gave up the music business, so to speak, and you you were at Dean Close. You weren't, I know you said you were a housemistress, but you were also a teacher, I think, before you became a housemistress. So what, were you teaching music or, or something yeah. else? Yeah, yeah, I was teaching um, clarinet and saxophone. I did some class teaching, usually maternity cover, 
Um, yeah. But mainly, um, flute clarinet is from one to one. Um, so, you know, it was it was ideal because if girls in the boarding house had problems, I could just reschedule their lessons um, and sort them out, you know, if they're in floods of tears or whatever. Um, it was an amazing job. I mean, to be part of young people's lives, because they were 13 to 18, um, was an honour. And some of the girls, you know, if their parents lived abroad or they were military families, um, they spent more time with me in the five years than they did with their own parents, which mm. is, yeah, it's sad for the parents, you know, the mums yeah. really hated when they had to drop them off and um, not see them for a while. But it was, it was an honour, honestly, to be involved in so many young people's lives. And are you still hearing from them now? I mean, you, you effectively stopped, you know, paid work uh, in the summer. I mean, now here we are getting towards Christmas. I mean, did you, uh, do you hear from them still? I'm sure you do. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, some of them are nearly 40. That is really scary. Uh, but they, a lot of them keep in touch. And that's the thing about social media, actually, because... Um, you can see what's happening. And we were supposed to have a great big reunion at Dean Close of all the girls I'd ever had. And of course that didn't happen, but we are still hoping that next year we might be able to do something. And I wanted them all to bring back their partners, their parents, because obviously mm. um, I was quite close. In fact, Helen Lovett was one of my parents. I had um, Louise mm. in my, and I have kept in touch with a lot of the parents and a lot of the girls. And um, it's exciting to see what they do next. Yeah, of course it is. And um, talking about next year, I'm hoping you will get your invitation to Buckingham Palace. Yeah, it's it's not Buckingham Palace, I think. It's St. James's. Oh. Isn't it? I okay. think so. But they may well change it. I don't think they've even done the January ones yet. No, no, I'm sure. So, so yeah, yeah, just nice. It was just nice to have it out in the open. Yeah. 2021 is going to be a great year for you. And. As we get towards the end of our chat, I mean, the Honourable Company, I mean, you're a uh, junior warden, so you've got a bit of time to wait uh, before you take over. Is that, do you think that's a good thing or is that a bad thing for you? Um, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, by then, hopefully we'll have lots of new members and yeah. um, it'll be exciting, you know, to see how Gloucestershire changes because there's lots of talk, isn't there, about... Gloucestershire needs more housing and once the new cyber park opens at GCHQ that's mm. going to encourage people from all over the world to come and work here, live here. Um, so exciting times and um, lots of new people coming to the county that hopefully will be able to get involved with the Honourable Company. Mm. So from your point of view, a positive perspective? I'm always positive Mark. I know. Let's call it a day on that note, should we, Julie? Thanks very much for talking to us today. And I'm sure our, our members will have learned a lot about you. And good luck uh, to you all your charity work that you do. It's, you're a fantastic example to all of us. Thank you very much.